Um, all right, we're gonna go a little closer to home now. Allison Fox is the president of American Prairie Reserve, or an organization dedicated to creating the largest wildlife complex ever assembled in the continental United States. When complete, the reserve will comp comprise 3.5 million contiguous acres of native grassland in northeastern Montana with a goal of restoring the wildlife abundance the landscape once contained. Thank you. Allison. Good afternoon. The American Prairie Reserve, it is indeed the American Serengeti, if successful. It's a terrific goal. Three and a half million acres. Is it possible? Yes, it is. I thought it would be fun to start with words from the man whose vision and career brought us all together today. When one of my colleagues filmed this interview with Dr. Wilson seven years ago, his encouragement may, meant a great deal to our team. It still does today, and we at American Prairie Reserve are very proud to be part of this afternoon. Our goal is indeed, as Dr. Wilson stated it, a three and a half million acre African Serengeti. This is an idea with both deep historical legitimacy it's also one that we hope will be a significant contribution to this idea of half earth, this very bold idea of half earth. The reserve is located in legendary Great Plains under Montana's dramatic big sky. The mighty Missouri River carves its way through the landscape. There are vast and open plains, undulating hills, timbered areas. It's expansive, beautiful, and one of the least populated places in the lower 48. Our vision is to create the largest wildlife reserve ever assembled in the lower 48, bring all the species back that were once there, and ensure the public, both the local, locals and people from around the world, benefit from its presence. We believe it will one day hold its place amongst the greatest treasures in our country. And really important for our topic today, provide inspiration for those from around the world to think big and pursue new models in this new millennium. As I said, the historical record supporting this vision is rich. The region, its bountiful landscape, and its abundant wildlife supported indigenous populations for millennia. Starting about 200 years ago, this, these scenes were widely chronicled. Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark described immense herds of buffalo, elk, deer, and antelopes feeding in one common and boundless pasture. Artists, Carl Bodmer, George Catlin, and later, Charlie Russell painted scenes like this. And it was actually George Catlin in the 1830s who was the first to call for the establishment of a nation's park on this landscape. But this did not occur. And actually, westward expansion dramatically changed the landscape. All of these species once called the area where we're now working home. And in a matter of decades, they were completely wiped off the landscape. Most notably and most widely known, of course, the American bison, now our national mammal. An estimated 30 to 60 million animals were reduced to a couple dozen in just the period of, of about 30 years. But the possibility to restore this landscape exists and it exists in the place where we're working. And when one looks at this, context, this biome in the context of half earth, the need is great. The status of temperate grasslands, both nationally and globally, is precarious. Nearly half of temperate grassland biome worldwide has been converted to other la land uses. This is one of the highest rates of conversion of any terrestrial biome. Furthermore, under 5% of the biome is protected for biodiversity conservation. Again, one of the lowest rates of any terrestrial biome. In fact, there are only four places, including where we're working in the Northern Great Plains, where temperate grassland ecosystem can be restored to scale. Among the re region's biodiversity values are these. It's a hot spot for grassland biodiversity, a priority area for endangered species and other species of concern, like the black-footed ferret, the pallid sturgeon, the greater sage grouse, and the sprague's pipit. So how do we do this? The first essential part of our mission is to go big. 
conservation biologists recommend a, per, a grassland ecosystem would need to be about 5,000 square miles or 3.2 million acres in order to be fully functioning. Climate change makes this need to go big even greater. We also need a different model of park building than the one this country used in the late 19th and 20th century to protect our existing national parks. Our model is built on private-public collaboration, and it uses a market-based approach to ecosystem scale conservation. Finally, we need to find a spot where the conditions are right at this time in history. For, thus, for us, that means largely untilled blocks of native prairie, land for sale, and big concentrations of public land. That public land creates a tremendous leverage opportunity. Our model is to buy 500,000 acres of private land and link it with an existing nearly 3 million acres of public land and work with those agencies to manage the habitat towards common wildlife and public access goals. To date, the lands you see in blue are just under 400,000 acres that American Prairie Reserve has assembled. Those are private and leased public lands and they surround the existing million acre Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge. In this way, the reserve is being assembled unlike any other park in, in this country's history. And again, it'll be eventually 5,000 square miles, which is the size of the African Serengeti, also the size of the state of Connecticut, and a million acres bigger than Yellowstone National Park. So where are we today? The reserve is both operational and a work in progress. Once we acquire the land, we must, we must remodel it from its current use to focus on biodiversity. This includes, this includes restoring natural systems and processes, like re riparian corridors, and it, rem it means removing miles and miles and miles and miles of interior barbed wire fencing, like you see here. Over the last 12 years, we've established a bison herd, a conservation bison herd, nearly 1,000 strong. We've helped these guys, prairie dogs, we've helped grow prairie dog towns. Um, it's important for this keystone species and the 150 other uh, species that, that depend on the islands of habitat they create. All of this activity is, is guided and evaluated using our grassland restoration scale. This is called the Frazee scale and examines 10 drivers of grassland ecological health. We don't and we can't do this work alone. We work with partner NGOs, we work with universities, we work with scores of volunteers to do all of this work, and we see even more opportunity in the years to come to use technologies to map, monitor, and manage out on this landscape. Finally, critical to our discussion today, we're working actively in partnership beyond our eventual boundaries. We're thinking bigger than just our protected area for resiliency and for eventual perpetuity. We need to create soft boundaries around American Prairie Reserve. That means recognizing that we're working in a working landscape and that wildlife abundance will have an impact on the ranching community around us. So we want to find a way where the ranching community around us can not just tolerate wildlife, but actually benefit from the presence of American Prairie Reserve and benefit from that wildlife. To this end, we've started a beef company. We're selling natural grass-fed beef in outlets across the country. And this beef, in part, supports our wild, wildlife-friendly ranching program called Wild Sky. The way Wild Sky works is ranchers in the neighboring region agree to modify their ranching operations in exchange for technical assistance and financial incentives uh, to be more wildlife-friendly. This means not tilling native prairie above all else. It also means installing wildlife-friendly fencing, installing uh, camera traps on the properties. And these, these management actions are chosen and then audited using that same grassland restoration scale, the Frazee scale. So this story is best told through its participants. This is Dave and Ronnie Crasco. They ranch on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. And when we met Dave, he was, he was skeptical of Wild Sky and not necessarily a fan of American Prairie Reserve. But through a number of conversations about our shared appreciation for wildlife, he ended up enrolling in Wild Sky. They're third year participants in Wild Sky now. And so when went, a camera trap on his property captured this image and later one of a black bear, he was actually quite relieved to know that this species, these species could coexist uh, with his cattle operation. Importantly, we're looking um, even beyond our boundaries to what we call the Greater Montana Wildlife Triangle. We have a good fortune of being just a few hundred miles from the most in intact ecosystem in the lower 48. 
And this is where wildlife, particularly predators, are going to come from to the American Prairie Reserve region. So we can sign up wild, uh, wild sky ranches in these corridors and change the sociology, change how people view wildlife in these corridors and work with other partners who are doing important work in these areas. So the stars on this map you see represent our existing wild sky ranches, some right in the American Prairie Reserve region and some, as you can see, on the northern end of the greater Yellowstone ecoregion. Finally, this afternoon, like all the other park building efforts you've heard of, public engagement, involvement, and benefit for us means building visitor infrastructure so people from all walks of life can come and enjoy this landscape and learn from this landscape. Our Enrico, our Enrico Education and Science Center is home base for students, volunteers, and educators. These, like these volunteers planting shrubs, or this group of high school students from New York City who spent 12 days on American Prairie Reserve. And having never experienced nature outside of New York City's public parks, it was quite an experience to, to be out on the reserve. <laughs> Next up is the establishment of a 200 mile wide hut to hut system. The first huts will be open next spring, and they will eventually uh, be all connected all over this 200 mile la wide landscape so that visitors can go by foot, by bike, by horseback, and even by canoe to these backcountry facilities set amongst the reserve's most beautiful places. In closing, we're pursuing three parallel tracks, acquiring the habitat, remodeling that habitat to focus on biodiversity, and ensuring public benefit. And because of this integrated approach, we believe we're well on our way towards success. The success is made possible by supporters from all around the world. We literally have donors all from all 50 states and, and quite a number of countries, and they make this all possible. I began with Dr. Wilson, who I'm looking at right now, <laughs> and so I'm gonna end with him too. In the same interview that um, my colleague filmed, uh, Dr. Wilson was asked about kids in nature. He was asked about why it's important to expose youth to nature. He talked about how valuable it is to the development of a child's mind to interact with nature and even handle other forms of life. And he said of kids in nature, and I love to quote this, there is a union of great potency and benefit to humanity. There is a union of great potency and benefit to humanity. It is on American Prairie Reserve that we hope experiences like this occur for generations. And in building this park, we are also doing our part in creating the next generation of conservationists, the next generation of stewards of this planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison.